Let's take a look at some of the latest news around the whole Canon R5 overheating. I know, I know, it's played out, we get it. There's people who like the camera and there's people that don't. I'm gonna do something a little bit different for this video. I've got the cool blue light behind me so everything stays nice and calm. We can stay cool and collected and just go over some of the latest tests from EOS HD because that's kind of, he's been doing a lot with the R5 since he has one, putting it in his fridge is the test we're gonna look at today. And then I'm gonna try and kind of counterbalance that with some other stuff from maybe some different perspectives. I have an article pulled up from Canon News and we can kind of look at that and hopefully we can find some balance somewhere in the middle because maybe I've been too hard on the R5, maybe I've been too hard on Canon. There's a lot of people that love these cameras for photography and if you want a real video camera, go buy a real video camera, it's not the R5. I get it, I understand it. We're gonna look at just what's going on because this is kind of I think really fascinating as far as digital photography, video production, uh, professional filmmaking, all the things combined into this one camera from rumors, from marketing, from just people's desire to have a hybrid while other people purely just wanna do photography. And it's really interesting to see how this is all unfolded and how it's still developing. I think it's good to look at all the information possible and kind of figure out what is gonna make the most sense for you. Because I've said it before, I don't think the R5 is a terrible camera for some purposes. So let me just be clear with that right off the bat. There's nothing inherently wrong with the R5 if you're gonna use it for what it's good at. If you are hoping to get a little bit more out of it, that may be where you run into trouble. And at this point, we all kind of know about the overheating, so that's not really the big news. It's just more of understanding, trying to, peel this thing apart and figure out like why why it is the way it is. So let's take a look over at eoshd.com. This is Andrew Reed's blog. He's been doing this for a long time. So this isn't just some, you know, like let's uh, pull some articles together and capitalize on the, on the controversy. He's been criticizing Canon for a long, long time. And so maybe that shows a little bit of his bias there, but we're gonna take a look at this article. I definitely encourage you to read the full thing for yourself because we're just gonna go over some highlighted uh, components. But basically he took his R5 and he took a intervalometer taking one JPEG every 60 seconds inside of his fridge just 60 photos per hour, so a photo a minute with no video recording. These are the, the testing scenario that he set up. The camera's internal temperature was taken every minute in the fridge from the JPEG EXIF data. So basically the JPEG and the metadata, it'll display the temperature, at least some approximation of the temperature. And we'll get into that in a little bit as we kind of peel this apart and see if we can trust this 100% or maybe if there's some questionable things that we may want to look at that could be explained legitimately. We'll, we'll get to it. Um, so looking at basically a four degree Celsius ambient air temperature, that's just above 32 degrees Fahrenheit. So right, you know, before it's a freezer, it's in your fridge. So maybe like 36 degrees Fahrenheit. I don't actually know exactly what it is, but my fridge is set to 36 degrees Fahrenheit with the camera body exhibiting no warm areas. It's cold to the touch. Okay. After 30 minutes, he briefly switched into 8k video mode for just four seconds to see how much time remained on the, and he calls it the cripple clock. Let's just call it the overheating warning timer. Uh, then back into stills mode, he repeated this check again after 60 minutes and the overheat control was turned off in the menus uh, as he finds it makes little difference to video mode and shouldn't be needed in a fridge. Um, so here's his allegations of what he's positioning and saying this is what Canon's doing. So he says Canon allegedly have uh, at limited high-end video modes sold on the R5 with artificial timers disguised as overzealous thermal management software to segment the production from professional camcorders. This is a, a common theory, maybe it's a conspiracy theory, maybe it's a pretty pretty solid guess of what Canon is doing with their photography cameras and kind of limiting their capabilities just to protect their cinema, broadcast, higher end video production cameras. A lot of people allege this. I don't know if it's ever been you know proven with some email from Canon or any leaked documents saying as much, but it's pretty obvious from their practices that they're definitely protecting something you would think, at least. I don't think it's a, it's a far stretch. And I think most people kind of go along with that, but maybe this is the most blatant offense um, in recent memory. Uh, number two, Canon allegedly may have designed the camera with purposefully ineffective cooling for the main image processor and lied to their customers in an official statement. This statement implied the magnesium alloy body was used to mitigate heat. A teardown of the body shows a lack of thermal pad to conduct heat from the processor to the magnesium alloy casing, even though chip is the primary heat source in the camera. 
he's basically alleging that they intentionally designed it to overheat. I talked about this article uh, in another video and people have pulled it apart. I'm not an electrical, mechanical, any type of engineer. I don't exactly know the best way to design a camera. If I could design a camera, I would, I'd love to. I don't actually know. So this is out, uh, kind of out of my depth, but let's just say people have looked at the internal guts of the R5 and thought, mm, maybe they could have done something a little bit better to account for this heat. Maybe they didn't want to, maybe they didn't care. That's up to Canon. Maybe there literally isn't a way to do it because it's a 45 megapixel sensor. So we'll talk about some of those kind of rebuttals a little bit later as well. And his third point is that, as well as misleading advertising claims, such as it being suited for professional cinematographers and a hybrid mirrorless camera for professionals comfortable shooting alongside the C300 Mark III. Canon are alleged to have misled customers over the official overheating times by not making it clear that the limits can be reached in under 60 minutes without recording a single frame of video. This is something that's been brought up a few times for people who have defended Canon in the situation saying that, you know, it's just the people who were, you know, spouting off the rumors about 8K RAW and 4K 120, they got everyone hyped. It wasn't Canon themselves. However, that is not true. Canon did push this camera fairly heav heavily with some of their announcements and marketing saying that this is, you know, a video cinema type camera that should be used on these types of productions. And it just turns out that in practical use, it doesn't really function as such. So let's get past some of this stuff and move on to uh, some of the uh, additional details from the test. He says, after just 30 stills in the fridge, one per minute and no video recording whatsoever, it says halfway through the test, so 30 minutes in, the maximum available recording time in 8K video mode fell down to five minutes from the 15. This is really interesting when you think about it because the camera is just taking JPEGs, so what could it possibly you know, be processor intensive about that? cameras have been shooting JPEG for quite a while, so nothing crazy there. It is odd though that just shooting JPEGs warms the camera up enough, not out in the sun, not in 100 degree temperatures like I have here in Phoenix, Arizona, but in a fridge. Seems a little suspicious that the timer would tick down just shooting JPEGs. And then after 60 minutes and 60 JPEG images, the overheating warning icon was flashing. When I switched to 8K video mode to check, zero minutes of recording time was available. So I hadn't even recorded anything, just switched into the mode and there's no, no option to do it because the camera's overheated. Then the camera shut down, giving you the warning, overheated, shutting down in the fridge, even though it was left idle in video mode for around two minutes, not recording. So just sitting there, not recording anything to the memory cards, not, uh, you know, constantly shooting and capturing data where it's it's really trying to process all it's feeding is you know the live view and then you know taking all these jpegs so he goes on to kind of document the exif data from those jpegs and the temperature and as you can see here the camera never got above 34 degrees celsius basically the camera was taking pictures, but it never uh, reported heating up. If you've looked at other situations where uh, people have done something similar, not in a fridge, the camera, the EXIF data will warm up and you'll see that temperature rise. EOS HD, he's even talked about it in another blog post where he did a test and you could read the EXIF data warming up. So it does seem like in this test, the fridge was doing something to keep that internal thermometer cool and we'll talk about some of the rebuttals to that in a little bit, but at least as far as the JPEG EXIF data goes, it's staying cool. There's nothing, uh, you know, no alarm bells should be going off. So let's scroll down here uh, and wrap this up. Even the back of the camera, which sits a millimeters from the central processor and RAM was cold to the touch with no hotspot. The CF Express card was also cold to the touch after removing it from the camera. The cripple clock seems to tick down to zero minutes over the same period of time, just 60 minutes, just as it does in a room at 23 degrees Celsius or outside in the blazing hot sun at 35 degrees Celsius. So uh, over to you, Canon. Uh, he paid <laughs> the money. Now you owe him an answer. So let's look at this, just some of my initial thoughts. There's, first of all, there's nothing to say that that internal thermometer inside of the camera that's recording that JPEG EXIF data, there's nothing to say that that's actually taking a fair reading at the right spot. The hottest point within the camera may not be next to that thermometer. So that temperature data could be skewed slightly. In some of the testing that's been done, it does look like it rises and falls. In this test, it didn't. Granted, the camera was in a fridge, so that sort of makes sense that maybe it's somewhere, and that I'm kind of you know, playing devil's advocate here, trying to defend Canon. Maybe this inter internal thermometer 
is slightly at a wrong spot that's not really getting all that warm, but another component within the camera is getting really, really hot. That could be. As well as, I would say that if that were the case, that that one component that's getting really, really hot is not really going to be all that affected by the ambient temperature. So even though the camera's in a, a fridge, let's say, the device, the component itself could still get really, really hot just from processing data. The ambient temperature would definitely help and it wouldn't aggravate the problem, but it's a lot more, it's different than, you know, blowing cold air directly on that spot. And we can take a look over here at Canon News, because I thought this was another kind of counterbalance article, um, which was written up to kind of talk about maybe some of the reasons why this would be happening. So uh, he shares his thoughts, uh, basically saying this is a sealed camera. Um, he can't say this enough. There's no airflow, no way of getting hot ambient inside of the camera out to the outside with a great deal of efficiency, unless it's directly attached to the outer magnesium shell. You can't think of it like your personal computer and think of all the heat sinks and paste and fans and think the same in a camera. It is two entirely separate engineering problems. And this is fair in a fair, at least uh, on, a, on the surface, looking at saying, okay, this camera is sealed. There's no airflow, like on your personal computer, you've got fans and vents and you know, airflow, so it's ejecting the hot air. With a sealed camera like this, there's not room for that air to, to escape. So everything's kind of trapped and contained and you don't have that airflow over the CPU if that's what's warming up to keep it cool like you would in a computer. It's now pretty common knowledge that the CFE cards are getting, so the uh, CF uh, Express cards are getting very warm. There's even a warning when you open the Canon R5's door, that's stated warning and the cards may be very hot. This is something other people have talked about that, oh, if you take the cards out, you can record externally, no problem. When you do record with the CF Express cards, they do get really hot, not only on the R5, but just in general, they seem to, in certain situations with certain devices, these cards, even if they're transferring uh, data to and from a computer, Computer can get really, really hot as part of the, the technology if, if proper uh, cautions and considerations aren't uh, taken into account. So I, I'm going to get to this a little bit later because I think this point doesn't really make that much sense to me, but I'll at least say there are some people who have encountered the cards themselves getting hot, which could be definitely contributing to the problem. I don't think it's the core reason, but let's say if the camera's warming up and then the cards are also getting really hot, that's definitely not ideal. He goes on, uh, there's an issue of heating up the area around the sensor. While this doesn't dramatically impact video because they only shoot a 10-bit usually and the maximum 12-bit for RAW, for stills performance and exacting the most dynamic range from the camera, heat around the sensor increases the noise. This increase in noise has a dramatic impact on the camera's ability to record a high dynamic range image. This has to be a major factor in the internal operating temperatures of the camera. This is absolutely true. So like we are talking about before, if that thermometer is in a, in a point in the camera where where it's not reading the true hottest component in the device, but it's just giving you a general sense of the internal temperature. Maybe it's up to 60 degrees Celsius or something like that. That just in itself, if it's warming up the sensor is gonna create noise. And this is true if you're filming out, like I do often here in the desert, in the middle of summer, if you wanna do a time-lapse or something, the sensor gets a lot more sensitive to kind of uh, noise and interference just from the heat. It kind of activates those photocytes in a way that's not capturing light data, it's capturing heat, or it's you know kind of a, a, a nice way to think about it more or less. So typically when you're doing time-lapses, especially any kind of astrophotography or anything like that. You want a cold camera, you want a cold night. You don't wanna be out when it's over 100 degrees Fahrenheit because the sensor is gonna be noisier. And so that's 100% understandable and, and totally fair if Canon were looking at it going, hey, this gets too hot and we need to protect our image quality so we can't have it getting that hot in here. Maybe the parts theoretically can handle it. Maybe they'll degrade a little faster over time, but just bare minimum, we want it to be able to take good images and keep the sensor kind of clean from any kind of uh, interference from, from heat, which makes sense. And then he goes on to say, low temperature burns. So when you hold an object that has an elevated temperature over time, you can develop what is known as a low temperature burn. In lower temperatures around 44 Celsius, you may just get a red skin at the point of contact. However, this can actually cause serious problems if the temperature is slightly more elevated around 50 degrees Celsius. So I can imagine this being true for sure if you're holding like a, you know, a hot cup of coffee. It doesn't, it's not pleasant to hold it for a long time, even though it's not physically burning you in the moment, the prolonged 
period of exposure would cause burns of some kind. Same thing is true of ice. If you have ice that just touches your skin, it's not gonna instantly freeze and give you like freezer burn. But if you leave it there for a long period of time, if you put some salt on there, it's gonna get even colder and that can cause some you know, skin damage and, and irritation. So it does make sense that you wouldn't want the camera externally to get too hot. The problem with this component that I'll just kind of rebuttal back to this uh, article is that most people when they're testing the camera and it overheating and they're, they're kind of you know holding the camera, the, the issue isn't the camera itself is getting hot and you could say, well, Canon didn't want that to happen. So they just left all the heat inside and they, you know, to, to protect people's hands. I don't think that's a very good solution considering if we're talking about a situation as we've talked about in the, in the article from EOS HD, that it's in, a, it's in a fridge and it's just taking JPEGs and the camera is still producing crazy amounts of heat, crazy to the point where it just shooting basic JPEGs locks you out of all the high-end video modes. You would think that maybe the video modes cause excessive, excessive kind of uh, toll on the processor so that would make sense, but just shooting JPEGs warms it up to, enough to the point that that if you put it to the to the alloy casing, that it would burn your hands theoretically, M maybe. But I think that's a little bit of a stretch, and probably you know something else should have been done to mitigate the problem rather than you know even considering burning someone's hands by piping heat from from inside the camera to the casing. This is not anything I've ever experienced on any other camera that doesn't overheat but you know, is doing processor intensive things. Uh, you know, the GH5 shooting 4K60, you've got things coming out, you know, like the A7S III. And I know the A7 cameras have had overheating issues in the past, but even the S1H, granted it has a fan uh, in it, but you also have the S1, the S1R. There's many, many cameras and not one of them have I ever, has ever gotten like hot in my hands the same way that like a laptop will get hot on your lap just from kind of running sometimes the, Apple MacBook Pros are, are kind of notorious for that being a thing ongoing over the many, many years they've been making those laptops. They just run kind of hot. And I can definitely imagine getting burnt, but I've never experienced anything like that from a camera. So I, I, I'm not really sure what to make of that. And then he goes on to say, this is why so much care and attention usually goes into server equipment and why they usually have massive cooling systems because to guarantee their reliability, you can't run them hot. True, you know, it's not good to run your computers super hot. If you have a server or any kind of, you know, hard drive or any data electronic components, it's always gonna be, you know, the weakest point of failure. The one thing that fails first is kind of what you have to set everything to, that lowest common denominator. So it's not a good practice to run anything too hot. So definitely makes sense if the camera is legitimately getting too hot, the R5, that that should be limited. You wouldn't want that toll on the hardware itself. The allegation isn't really that it actually is too hot. It's it's in a fridge. It's just taking JPEGs. Why am I locked out of this mode? So again, I'm gonna kind of balance that out by saying yes, you should. The, if the R5 is truly running hot, it's understandable that it would lock you out. But in these situations where nothing is really showing that it is, why is it then in that situation where everything is apparently cool that you're still locked out? Uh, he goes on, when you have air trapped inside of a camera, and even if you open the doors, it's still trapped inside the camera. Air isn't exactly a good conductor of heat, so it's going to take a while for elements internal to the camera to cool down. The fact remains that tests do show that extreme ambient temperature drops, like aka freezer, can re greatly reduce the cool down time. So this is something that people have pointed to. Some people have put the camera in their freezer to, to really cool it down, and that does, um, in certain tests, speed up the, the recovery timer slightly. I think you still have an, this issue where like it's not happening very fast. It's just like th there's a difference, but how significant and to what degree, like why is it taking so long? Is the temperature gauge inside really reflective of the, of the hottest component? It's hard to know for sure, uh, but I'm sure we'll get there as more and more people crack these cameras open because I think it's, it's really, really interesting. So uh, you can read this full article over on canonnews.com as well as the latest from EOS HD. However, I wanted to add my own thoughts, my extra thoughts in, in, in addition to what we've already been talking about is that as all this relates to the R5, I think people, it's very easy to argue back and forth on the pro Canon, anti Canon, back and forth. The camera overheats, it's unusable. And other people say, well, I use it for photography. I think it's great, P ping ponging back and forth. I think this misses the point, and I talked about this in another video, but I wanted to bring it up again, in that the R6 also suffers from these same overheating issues. And it's not 45 megapixels, 
it's 20 megapixels. It doesn't have CF Express cards, it has SD cards, and it's not shooting 8K RAW or 4K 120, it's shooting 4K 60. So when you look at all of that, I, I, I can imagine there's a scenario where the R5 overheating is justifiable in some people's minds. They look at it and they go, it's a photography camera, uh, Canon didn't really care too much about the video side of things, so it overheats. But for the same problem to represent itself twice on two different models in a very, very similar way, that is what is kind of suspicious to me personally. You know, the lightning striking twice in the same spot in the same way, kind of odd. So I wrote up my thoughts on, on why I think this is at least questionable. I'm not saying Canon is 100% guilty, proven, case closed, you know, send them off, never buy a Canon camera again. But I think there's some things we have to take into account just to keep this all balanced and, and look at it rationally, reasonably, try and have a decent, honest conversation about it because I'm not here just to hate on the R5 or the R6. I really want the cameras to be their, the best version of themselves that they can be. And so I think there's some things that are, are questionable. So this isn't just a CF Express card issue. It's also an issue on the R6, which has SD cards. So the fact that the, the CF Express cards get really, really hot is not really an argument one way or the other. It is a factor that might be contributing, but it is not the core issue. The camera itself is always cooking, whether you're shooting JPEGs or you're in the menu or no matter what function you're doing on these cameras, that timer is always ticking down because the camera is always warming itself up to these kind of dangerous levels where you know the, the high-end modes are limited and locked out. Even 4K30 HQ is locked out and you can't do any of that if you're just shooting JPEGs. You, you're always limited to kind of the lowest of the low end 4K, regular frames per second, even if you're just shooting JPEGs. So I think that's kind of very, very strange as well. Like why is the camera always getting hot? And then why are the EXIF data temps normal? Why in a fridge and you're, and you're reading that temperature gauge, why is it staying consistent with what the ambient temperature is or you know a, a shade above it? Um, compared to like in, in normal testing, if you're in your house or you're outdoors and it's warming up and then it's overheating. Why is one curve go up and it overheats and one stays flat and it overheats? Both scenarios shouldn't be true. You should get more time out of the colder one or at least that data, the, the temperature readings should be going up if it's an actual reading, which some people say maybe it's not. Maybe it's not a true temperature reading uh, that we can trust. It, like I said, I don't know one way or the other. It's just questionable. Uh, we've also got, why did Canon market the camera based on unusable features? That's a really big question in my mind. Is it just a miscommunication between engineering and marketing? And they, the departments got you know, confused where engineering said, no, that's literally impossible. And marketing says, we don't care. We're going to say it does 8K RAW. We're going to say it does 4K 120. We're going to market to you know, cinematographers and the like. It doesn't make sense that they would intentionally make a camera broken and then also target it to those same people who those features would be suited for. It's it's almost like they wanted it to be a problem for these people, which doesn't make any sense. So why did they do that? It's odd. And then why is the R6 also affected? This is also very strange to me that understandably the R5 being 45 megapixels doing these high-end modes makes sense, but what about the R6? How do you factor that one to the equation as well that the same problem plagues both cameras? And then ultimately, why was this okay? Why did someone look at the situation and say, yeah, like that's no problem. Like we'll just put this, you know, overheating uh, sensor thing in there. We won't fix the problem. We won't uh, try and compensate or, or limit the mode, like not even have the mode in there, you know? Well, if it overheats in 8K or we can't do 8K raw, then we can't do it. So why was this okay? Why did someone say, yeah, let's, let's do it. Let's push it forward and send it out to market as is knowing all the issues, knowing, you know, looking at the internal design, if they didn't care to make it better or to fix the problem, why even push it out in the current state just to maybe catch a few extra dollars from people who want 8k raw and 4k 120 and then realize the camera doesn't do it. That's a huge misstep if that's true. So that's where I'm going to end it for this one and, and just wrap it up there. Like I said, I don't, <laughs> I don't have a say really one way or the other. I wish these cameras were great. I did a stream way back when saying, ah, these, these cameras are probably be kind of broken or there's gonna be some, there's gonna be something a little, a, a little 
problem, even though they sound great on paper, there's gonna be something wrong with them. And I wanted to be wrong. I was looking at it coming out where all the rumors were, were confirmed true. And it was like, oh, wow, I'm, maybe I'll end up buying one of these cameras. And then, no, sure enough, the overheating issue uh, has come about. And at this point, it kind of is what it is. People are hoping the Canon does some kind of firmware adjustment. They'll probably do something, you know, some small little tweak or adjustment in terms of the, the firmware that reads these sensor inputs and outputs and gives you a little bit more time, or maybe it's a little bit more accurate. But at this point, there's definitely some really big questions that still haven't been answered. And I appreciate all the people doing the tests with these cameras, pulling them apart, putting them in their freezer. None of that is recommended, by the way. And if I had one, I might be tempted to do something similar, but I don't have an R5 on me. And I might look at getting an R6 to potentially test it, but it seems like so expensive to buy a camera just to then have to rip it apart to figure out why it's kind of broken in the way it's broken. So maybe I'll just gracefully back away and let other people do that as well. But I at least wanted to talk about it because I think it's really interesting, the progress that's being made in the same way that Canon cameras have always been hacked and pulled apart with Magic Lantern and, and whatever else it might be. People are, are desperate to use these uh, machines to their fullest. And whenever they're limited, they always find these fun workarounds. Right now, we're resorting to putting cameras in fridges and freezers. That's not really a functional onset workaround, but I'm sure at some point, someone will figure out, well, if you just take it apart in such a way and you put these extra elements in it and you really hack and mod it, you can actually get it to record consistently. I'm sure it'll happen eventually. I don't know how much it's gonna cost or who's gonna do it, but I look forward to seeing that day.